Forgive me. I'm keeping it cool and having a uh, class of scotch as I do. Oh, much classier shit. than us. Well, what time is it for you guys? I'm at a much different time of day. <laughs> oh, yeah. What, where are you? Uh, Toronto. Oh. No, it's the same for you guys. Same for me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. We're the same. Yeah, three. Th- You're Josh. You're the one at a different time. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm three hours back. Yeah. I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Welcome back to Adulthood Friends. This is the discussion based podcast where two former childhood acquaintances, now friends, discuss the things that adverb. Brad? An adverb for us? An adverb? Any adverb. We're putting you on the spot to start with. Oh my God. I'm almost blanking on a proper definition of an adverb. What do you want? I told Josh to prepare you. <laughs> they got you. the LYs. I told him to know? tell you about an adverb. Josh. No, I didn't want to prepare you at all. I just thought I'd say like, let's Curve Oh my God. An adverb is. <laughs> Damn you, Josh. <laughs> it's Josh's fault. Let's be clear. Yeah, totally. <laughs> oh, I see what you're going for. You're doing the whole... Uh, you're ripping off the Conan O'Brien needs a friend. I feel strong we are? about how. <laughs> I have no idea. What are we ripping off? Oh, no. He does do something like that. Are we ripping something off? He does that at the beginning of every podcast. <laughs> I've never seen that. Oh, I love it. It's, it's a podcast, Josh. You don't see it. You hear it. Oh. I'm being a jerk to Josh again. But it's not the same as the Conan O'Brien one. No, it's not, not the same. we're not asking how you feel about being here. You're friend. not asking how I feel about being here. Exactly. It doesn't even have to be meaningful. It can be any adverb. It can be strongly. It can not even strongly. 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 Okay. Let's go with that. I don't think we've ever used strongly before. Really? There we go. There we go. Now we have. Yeah, I've brought something new to the table. Thank you. <laughs> Finally. <No. laughs> so the things that strongly matter. Strongly. That's your adverb of the week. Nice, nice. And I'm Aya. <laughs> I'm Josh. And I'm Brad. Or I don't know how your process goes for that. Do it. No, no. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> hey, yeah. Brad Bangs Bowl coming to you from Toronto, Canada as well. Hey. Nice. Yes. So as you just heard today, we have a special guest, Brad Bangsville, and for episode 44, 44, we'll be talking about following your passion. So what are the consequences of following or not following your passion? Do you know what your passion is? How did you discover it? And how should you continue following your passion? If you even should. Or should you continue following <laughs> it? You know. Depends on how illegal your passion is. <laughs> yeah. uh, should we get into it? Let's do it. Let's get into it. back oh it's so good to be back thank you for having me it's nice to see you brad i think i haven't seen you since high school actually i'm trying i was trying to pinpoint when the last time yeah. we possibly it would have been high school because i don't Probably. think we you did you go to western yeah i did but and you're I still was, at western in a way right yeah but i was very not social so i was just kind of like in my own little world so i didn't really guarantee we cross paths at Probably. some point yeah <laughs> probably walked by you in a hallway she teaches at western now oh my god yeah see i need to do my research you're teaching at western now no you don't it's okay yeah i'm teaching <laughs> spanish right now oh okay. that's amazing oh thanks it's fun yo brad yo you look fantastic. Thank you. I had a shower. You look sexier than ever. <laughs> I'll take it. I like your Superman curl. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> That's, I just worked out and it, my hair is doing weird shit. I don't know. Congratulations. You're better than me. I haven't worked out in quite some time. You wouldn't know it. <laughs> just, just work out the cheekbones eating excessively. But yes, thank you. I don't know. I've... um. Yeah, I do not work out. <laughs> I did get a lot of walking around through Boston the last couple of days. That's like the most workout I've gotten in some time. What were you up to? <laughs> Uh, I had a, um, my short film was playing in the Boston side. Oh, shit. Short film called? Moore's Void. Moore's Void. Oh, I saw that. We all saw it, yeah, in London at the film festival. Right. Yes, you were were working for uh, the Forest City Film Festival. Forest City Film Festival, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, it was good. I liked it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Fantastic film. It deserves all the accolades it's getting. It is. Oh, much appreciated. It's thought-provoking. It's creepy. It's freaky. And it makes me want to see a full length feature of that. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> of Moore's Void? Spin off. Cool. Part of the world. That'd be fun. Yeah. No, it's like gestation. Well, without getting too much into talking about these passion things, but Moore's Void was rooted in just, I had a world that I've been building for so long, a world that, when you think about it as a film, had a lot of dollars attached to it that would not be <laughs> feasible at this point yeah. in my life. So <laughs> I found what nugget of it I could that I could do a short film with. And then, mm. With the traction it's getting, the next project down the line seems like a, a good little spin off of uh, growing that world I've been working on. Nice. So let's back up just like a second and, yeah, let, like how do we all know each other? Obviously, some of us know each other better than others, but like, yeah, how did we all meet? How far back? Yeah, Brad, what do you, what do you know? What do you remember? 
<laughs> trying to think of the overlap. Masonville? I didn't go to Masonville. You didn't my go brother, to Masonville, right. My brother did briefly. Right. I was trying to remember. So that would have been high school. It was high school. High school. Maybe Lucas. Yeah, and you were technically a year ahead of me. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you're ahead of us. We really... When did we really... We started hanging out... Somewhere upstairs. It was grade 11. <laughs> it would have been grade 11 drama class when they oh. had the split. That was the year we had the split where we had like the... Or... We definitely... We did drama. We did drama. It was 100% drama class. And Mr. Winter. Or for some reason, I missed it for a year and then went back. That's what it was. I went back and I, that's why we ended up in the same class, even though we were different years. You did a victory lap, right? Yes, I did. Was it a, was it a victory? I mean, I, it got me to where I am. Step so up. it is a victory. <laughs> it took some time, but it, it was correctly labeled. It was very helpful. <laughs> and I, uh, you also did drama, as we mentioned before, but you only did like first yeah. year, right? With Miss I just did the first one, yeah. But we were in that class together. Yeah, we were. I did Bohemian Rhapsody. I don't know what you did. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I also don't remember what I did and or don't want to share. But oh, yeah. Was it Spice Girls I, or something? What did you do? <laughs> I wish it was Spice Girls. No, the other girl picked it and it was... Um, doesn't matter. And Brad, I know <laughs> it was something embarrassing, I'm sure. I think I knew you first as Amanda's boyfriend. Yep. Is that weird? Okay. That was your name for the longest time, just Amanda's boyfriend. I just remember, oh, that's Amanda's, Amanda's boyfriend. boyfriend. Yeah. And then yeah. I knew, yeah. The last guest that we had on was Amanda. This is kind of cool. That's, uh, what a world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What a cool meeting. A... You guys are still friends, right? We uh, we are. We like. I mean, uh, we we haven't been in each other's circles for so long. So it's really just a case of maybe once or twice a year we'll reach out over Facebook or something. Just be like, "How's life? How you doing?" That's nice. This is going to sound kind of weird, but like you know, you guys were one of like probably the earliest like couples that I knew when I was younger, and it taught me a lot about how people can also remain friends after dating. Because you guys were always pretty cool afterwards. I totally get where you're going. Because it, uh, it wasn't a bad breakup. It was we were good friends. We really liked each other. But she, I forget. I, I've already blanked on where she was going to school after when when we made the choice to be like, hey, you're going that way. I'm going this way. Mm -hmm. Well, let's not blow it up. Let's keep in touch. <laughs> right. Yeah, I just remember you guys were just both like two of the sweetest people. Oh, Amanda, she's a fantastic human being and. Uh, I haven't had a chance to listen to that last podcast yet, but yeah, but I would. She's I would just love shit it. talking you the whole time. No, <laughs> son of a bitch. All right, well, everything I'm taking it back. Revoked. Yeah, all those she years is a of monster. <laughs> <laughs> so we all met each other in high school. I guess yeah. you and I got a little closer, but you would also cross into Aya's friend circle because you dated Amanda. Mm -hmm. That was like the most we really did. Uh, that was mainly when when we did cross paths. It was so. yeah. almost always through amanda yeah i think so yeah yeah and i didn't really hang out in university so i think that's when you guys got pretty close right with the we got even closer for sure in university yeah because we were friends through drama class like we definitely got along there and but then there was a, the brief period where we were both in university where we were doing our own thing for i think it was almost like three years before we started bumping into each other again and is we that were, it was, yeah it was so here's how i remember it and correct me if i'm wrong and yeah, we were kind of, yeah, of course we were, I'd say we were friends in high school, but our friend circles, well, I kind of skirted different friend circles. And I've talked mm -hmm. to I about this before too. The one you were with a, a group that I would kind of like stop by once in a while, sort yeah. of a thing. I was you know, an upstairs I, kid, the upper H hallway. Oh. See, I was also upstairs. <laughs> oh, were you? But I was in a different part of upstairs <laughs> that, okay. I, that I ate lunch. You're on the other side <laughs> of the exact same hallway. <laughs> were you in the hallway right next to the stairwell where we would eat? I, I think so. Where like Caitlin and Cassie and me and those. I was always in the upper hallway where if you open the doors, like the benches were there. But if you open the door that was yeah. on the side of it, you yeah. were just looking over the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on the benches. You were on the other benches, Josh. <laughs> next to where the kids used to break dance oh, okay. <laughs> so what was it like there was fergie and there was yep, michael uh, ferguson oh he's a good yeah him and i are still good we, we live oh, together <laughs> garrett sermansky was he there uh, he was there for uh on and off for a little bit he wasn't a regular okay. but he did kind of pop in and out of there and was matt was matt in our high school am i crazy matt 
Belfer was Belford, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. What am I crazy? Yeah. So you and Matt are still really close too, right? Yeah. That's another like on and off thing because him and I knew each other since kindergarten, and we're still like he's still my best friend. So you and Matt are like how Aya and I have known each other since kindergarten in those same circles where you're just around each other. Except that, that Aya and I only really uh, it's the whole purpose of this podcast. We didn't really become friends friends until we were like adults. <laughs> it's weird because you have so much to fall back on. You're like, hey, I knew this person for so long. We had lots of memories, but we didn't hang out to the same degree. And then you meet at different points in your lives where all of a sudden you've you've got common backgrounds that you can relate on, but whole different avenues you've you've gone for a few years that yeah. you're reconvening and sharing with one another. And you're like, you're an example to me as someone who's done a really good job at like staying in touch with and staying friends with, I mean, friends from your elementary and high school. I'd say I'm terrible at it, but I, I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how Matt and I are still friends. I don't know. You guys are both wonderful people and <laughs> makes sense to me. We mainly just hang out and talk Lord of the Rings. It's been like that for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, this actually leads me into, so in undergrad, when you and I started to hang out and do more stuff together. And one of the reasons is because I think our passions kind of intersected. 100%. But you had kind of still another, like a friend group in undergrad. And I had a friend group. I mean, I had friend groups that were not like related as much to my passion in many ways. Like I had very <laughs> academic oriented <laughs> friends. But you had uh, even people like Matt and was it Nick Workman? Yes. You guys yeah. started a radio show and a group called Nerd Alert, right? Yes, correct. On the subject of talking about our passions, and I guess Nerd Alert was the big stepping stone for me. Because uh, as we said, we met in high school and uh, drama class is what we shared together. And I'd say that was a good crucible for like what would turn into what our passions and our current careers are because it was an avenue to approach the things that we love, which was storytelling. I grew up loving movies, televisions. One of the first things I remember ever watching was 89's Batman. Like my parents always joke that Batman was my first word. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, and my life was very just much revolved around oddly not living in it, but living somewhere else the entire time, <laughs> occupying my fantasy brain. Land. Other, yeah. Living in fantasy land. But I was also kind of self-defeating in as much as I was like, oh, I would love to do that. And this is me talking from the perspective of an eight, nine-year-old. You know, like, oh, I'd love to be working on movies and television, but I live in London, Ontario, Canada, so that ain't gonna happen. Uh. <laughs> it, it was like very self -def It was very like stepping on my own dreams at that time. As like a little kid? Yeah, as a little kid, I didn't yeah. think that that would be a reasonable, I didn't think it was a realistic thing. I was just like, oh. What a practical child, yeah. It, oh, it was... <laughs> <laughs> like, I would love to do these things. Being from London, Ontario does that to people. You don't really see. I wonder if it's a little, this might be a terrible analogy and forgive me if it is. Do you know how there's people out there that don't see themselves like represented on screen? Yeah. There's a lot of groups that say we don't have representation on screen. So you don't, it's hard to see how you could potentially make it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why they say it's good to have representation. In a similar sense, like London, Ontario, you don't see oh people God. from our hometown represented out there. So you think, oh, Until why is that going to happen to me? Now, all of a sudden, we've got like Ryan Gosling and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Rachel McAdams, yeah. Justin like Bieber. Were there. Oh, my God. Yeah, okay. See, foot <laughs> pulling the giant foot out of my mouth now. <laughs> like as a kid, the I idolized Jim Carrey because he was loud, wacky and goofy. And I knew he was from j just nearby. And, you know, you learn about all these other guys. You're like, oh. That guy who made Aliens and Terminator is Canadian? Oh, cool. And James Cameron. I, yeah, no, it's it steadily grows as you learn this stuff. But I mean, at that time, as I got into high school and in drama, as fun as it was to start getting into theater and playing with this stuff, when I first went to university, you know, you're faced with that question of what are you going to do with your life? Yeah, what did you study at, you know, at Western? My first year, I just took a general because I, I, I don't know how many, I, I'm sure lots of people felt this way, but when I first went into it, I don't know why I didn't put the thing I was passionate about at the top of my ambition. Years later and dealing with it, probably fear and just not thinking it was realistic or it would happen. Or if I gave it a shot, it would probably just... Wait, what What was the thing you were passionate about when you went into university? Like specifically, how would you define that? Because I wonder, I feel like you probably knew like before I did, like at least you had an inkling of that earlier. I always knew like drama, acting, stuff like that, but I didn't really realize filmmaking was my passion till I was an undergrad. Fair, fair. And and again, it's that kind of metaphorical gun put your head of like, you need to make a choice now because you're about to spend a lot of money on it. I knew I wanted to like, in that same way you say, oh, I wish I could be an astronaut. I'd be like, I would have loved to have been a director. I would have loved to have been a storyteller. 
but I had done nothing at that point in my life to be like exercise those muscles. It was that weird sense of false confidence that sometimes I think everybody has where you're like, I feel like I'd be good at that. Have you ever done it? No, but I feel like I'd be good at it. And until you actually do it, you are, you don't have confidence in that thing you have false confidence about. Did you ever get to direct any plays in high school? Or I know we, we got, people got to do that in our class or was it just mostly acting? Oh, and I think a lot of it was- uh, what, Or writing. Right, Mr. Wintercorn, who I'm sure you've mentioned on this podcast before, he was a big pusher for me in that class where mm -hmm. I think he could tell that I loved doing stuff. I got excited and when I got into it, like I liked acting, I liked putting on impressions and characters and stuff like that. But I did love writing. And I, I'd say today my biggest strength is writing, mm -hmm. but I didn't do it very often. I would do short stories. And the only thing that helped me have any sense of feeling like I knew what I was talking about when I tried to do it was just how obsessively I would watch something I like over and over again. I would watch it studiously. Yeah. And I would just unintentionally kind of mirror the things that I liked when I tried to do it. Did you take that creative writing class in high school? Because I, uh, I and I took one. Wasn't it an official create? No, I don't think I did because I'm an idiot. But I was probably for the best. Because I, I well, <laughs> honestly, I took one and I, I mean, to jump a bit on what you're saying, Brad, like the first year of university, I also took a general and I never took another creative writing class after the one that we took in high school because I hated it so much. And it was kind of like, again, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I hated that one class. And I was like, you know what? Creative writing is not for me. So I eventually went the literature route. Dreams boot. Really? That made you not want to do it? That made me not want to. It didn't make me not want to write. It made me not want to take a writing course. So I went like the literature route and I was like, you know what? I'll study things that other people have written that are good. Just like you're saying with rewatching the same movies. I was like, isn't there just as much to learn about writing by reading what good writers have written? 100%. Than there is by forcing yourself to write when maybe you're not ready yet. Maybe you don't have all the experiences you need to start writing. That's 100%. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I kind of relate to not feeling right, even though like knowing this is that thing that I want to do, but like also feeling like I'm not ready to do it yet. Like I'm not ready to write yet, even though I know I want to. I don't know. Can you think of what it was about that class that did put the boot on it for you? Or like, no. I think it was, I just hated the teacher. That's, I don't know why. You really did, huh? I thought she was so nice. I know. I hated her. She liked some people. Oh, you said I she think. liked the guys in the class. That's what you said. I think she just, she was a weird lady, um, which is fine. I like weird people, <laughs> but she was the kind of weird that I didn't like. And I just, I don't remember what it was about her and her feedback. I found like really unhelpful. And I was like, she would give me a, a also like I was very Mark driven. So I, I think I was just like, you don't already like what I wrote. And she'd be like, no, oh, it's kind of, it's missing something. I'm like, well, what's it missing? Give me some better feedback. <laughs> and I just, it was probably pettier than that at that age. Oh, what was I 17, 18? I, I was probably just like, she didn't love my work and therefore she sucks. I mean, if you don't love Aya's work, you do suck. That's just <laughs> how it is. <laughs> no, I, I don't love that work either. It was, I don't think it was anything too drastic other than just, I was like, she doesn't understand me and there's no point in like continuing to try writing when I'm maybe I'm not ready for it or something so, that's the hard yeah. truth when it comes to a form that's subjective yeah it is very subjective to take exactly the point because it is super relevant to tie into where mm -hmm. the original question you were asking Josh of what led up to nerd alert so when I went to university and took the general I come from a big military family so I took my degree in history because mm -hmm. I've just always been surrounded by that's it cool. and I think part of the attractiveness to that was it was narrative. It was still a narrative. It was just the narrative of us and of context for the world that I'm surrounded in and what makes people tick. Are you a bit of a black sheep in your family and that you went, you know, towards the arts? Yes. <laughs> I can relate to you on that. Aren't yeah, we all? Yeah. yeah. Aren't yeah, we all? Definitely. <laughs> no. Well, we, I guess we should thank our parents for giving us the opportunity to be able to do that in this day. 100. Yeah. 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 Granted, I'll, I'll put However it my parents reluctant. never. <laughs> However, However reluctant they might be to let us or want us to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was, my parents never put that pressure on me. I, growing up watching the family I was surrounded in, and I think it's a self imposed pressure of, I'll put it in the sense that the, the, the military family that I did have or that I have did big things big Greg and mm. so there was a sense of if you're going to do something it's got to have meaning it's got to be big it's got to have purpose and so yeah. that in itself pressure was, pressure was daunting yeah by the way I just wanted to say too I just realized we all also grew up really really close to each other like I I know I don't know Ambleside if you, <laughs> yeah like, yeah, off, yeah we're all off Ambleside right off yeah Ambleside. yeah 
Bassenthwaite Crescent. You're all off the same street in this in suburban area. Oh, ba- I know Bassenthwaite. I take a yeah. shortcut. I live on Two Lane. Oh my god! And I would take that little. It was a nightmare. Take oh. that little shortcut. Is it just me or is my street have the most like racist sounding name? Whitehaven. White oh Haven. my <laughs> god! Yeah, I never even thought of that. Jesus I grew up on Josh. Whitehaven. Oh, very strict. Who was allowed to live on that? Is there a Black Haven nearby? There should no, be like that's a, even worse. Oh, that's or <laughs> at least like a beige haven. I don't know. Or a <laughs> brown haven. Uh, something else. I would rather have lived on the interestingly titled Bassam Thwaite. You are really white too, Josh. Did they check? Did... <laughs> they only let me live on that street because of how I looked. Did they do like a visual test? They didn't know I was Jewish. Because you are extremely wet. They didn't know. White. Did you have to wear sunscreen at night? Did you say I'm to... extremely wet? You're extremely white. <laughs> Did they hold swatches up to be like, you yeah, must be exactly. this pale to live on the street? No eggshell white. Yeah, there was another kid that my parents had and they got kicked out because they were, <laughs> they weren't, oh God. They got a tan and they were like, Mm-mm-mm. no nope. tans for you. Yeah, Daniel almost didn't make it. <laughs> he was quarantined for two weeks and used that tan. Uh, what's this What's this episode about again? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Okay, I will say though, growing up on Bassenthwaite with the last name Bangs Bowl was that's hilarious. A nightmare for ordering pizza. Oh my god. Oh yeah. <laughs> Always had to spell it out. Yeah. I had a good rhythm of how I dictated. Everything about you, Brad, is just so memorable to me. Your name is memorable. Like everything about you stands out. That's a good thing. That's what you want. <laughs> You know, Brad Bangs Bowl, double Take B's, it. grew up on Bassinth Way. What's the word there? It's not, it's not alliterated. What's the... It is alliteration. Yeah, yeah. alliteration. That's the word I'm looking for? Okay, yeah, right. it's good alliteration because you want that, I think, when you breaking bad, breaking Brad. Yeah, you won't need like a filmmaker name. <laughs> you want to make it as a movie director or you want to be memorable? Yeah, you won't have to change your name or anything like... It's a good one. It was an interesting name to grow up with. And when I first started looking at making films, I was like, do I use my last name? I grew up with Absolutely. Mr. Yeah, but I grew up with Mr. Carp with like Brad Breaks his balls and all those fun ones. Brad but, Bangs who? Like the teacher at our high school. He called <laughs> yeah, at our high school. Oh my he God. He straight up called me that on the attendance. And I was oh like, thanks, God. buddy. <laughs> that's not oh cool. God. You get paid to be here? <laughs> I will say there's last names that people make fun of. And it's like to make fun of the person. Oh, yeah. You to me are like, are cool. I'll take it and run with it. So when people make fun of your name, it's kind of like, I don't know. You, it doesn't hurt your coolness. It makes you more cool. It's one that like, it's a low hanging fruit to try and make fun of. But then when you put <laughs> it on the back of a jersey, you're like, hey, that, yeah, no, good. <laughs> Say that like I played a lot of sports, but barely did. So where were we? What were we? We were oh. saying I cut us off to talk about how close we live to each other. Right, right, right. We're talking about Nerd Alert, I guess, for now and what led up to there. And... Right. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, the point I was getting at there, to go back to your point, I, about how just subjective criticism or at least negative criticism in an art form, whether it's writing or making something that can be subjective, can really steer you off on a wrong course when, you know, that's just the opinion of something else. It's not finite where like in a math or a science class, you just got the answer wrong. Yeah. So yeah, when I went to university, did the general, did the history thing, I was doing that for about three years and I was a miserable human being. Mm-hmm. I, I was I was very depressed. I like it wasn't good. I was on a fast track to like, I, you know, seeing doctors, antidepressants, all that fun stuff. Because I just wasn't happy. I, I wasn't doing anything that I wanted to do. I felt very aimless. Were you aware that that was part of the reason or the reason why? Um, yes. I mean, yes and no. Being in a program that you knew you didn't want to do, like I was looking like, do I want to teach? that's not what I felt like doing. I wasn't involved in the things that I was passionate about, which I knew was, I like movies. I could talk for days about Back to the Future and Star Wars and these things I had to eat on my time. <laughs> Nerd alert. hi uh, <laughs> He said it. He said the name. <laughs> there, I, I think I had a breakdown in my third year where I, I finished my, uh, I was taking nothing but essay classes and I was writing paper after paper after paper and they were all late getting handed in because I had like no focus, but I was like, I know I can write something and hand it in a week and a half late and I'll get like a 79. So I just accepted my defeat and it's just, I knew the system and I played it out, but I wasn't happy. So I made the choice to quit school for a semester and take the summer. And uh, I traveled with my cousin. We went to Europe. I did that thing just to like clear my head and get away from just, just ask myself like, Hey Brad, what the do you want? And that was a big change for me. I came back and in the summer I was talking with Nick Workman and he was a good friend of mine. We were taking history together. It was from undergrad that you met him, right? Because that's when yeah. I met him. I met yeah, him yeah, through yeah. you. I don't, I shot a movie oh. at his house. 
That's where he lived. <laughs> yeah. We shot balls deep at his place. Right. I remember. I remember that. You were in that, right? I'm trying to. I'm You're in the party cert- portion. Oh, yeah. It. I'm in the party. I'm at the party. I do remember that. <laughs> Just to let for people listening, it's not a porn. It's a, it's a spoil it. It was a, it was a movie about two guys who wake up the morning after a party and one of them can't find a number that a girl left him. And the other one thinks he's got herpes and the friend agrees to drive him to the clinic. If he helps him find this number, <laughs> it's a ridiculous. good film. It was a ridiculous film, ridiculous. but it was fun. It was a good one. But it had like that hangover style where it would flash mm-hmm. back to the party as they tried to remember what happened the night before. And I used my actual 23rd birthday party, which I shot there. So you were in uh, Balls Deep. I certainly was. <laughs> the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you were Balls Deep in that uh, film. I'm trying to think. So it was around that time when... Oh, uh, Nick Workman's house. That's what you were saying. Yeah, Nick Workman's house. But well, it was it was that time I met Nick and I was... Or not met Nick, but uh, I had been chatting with him and he was a huge movie junkie in that same circle of everybody I was going to in the history program with was my friend, Matt, that we mentioned before that I've known for years. And all we did with all of our time was just talk cinema, talk movies, talk TV shows. And did I, uh, did you know Matt Belford in school at all? The name rings a bell, but I don't think I know. The circles didn't intersect, I guess. Sorry. I really kept to my little circle. Sure. (laughs) This is when you do the deep dive. You see on Facebook, I'm like, oh, I know that guy. I know that guy. (laughs) I'll do a Google while they're... No. Oh yeah, yeah, Matt Ball Boyle Ball Belford. Belford. That's right. Yes, I know him. We go way back. Remember him in many of Mr. Anderson's classes. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. <laughs> but yeah, so it was at that point just kind of chatting with Nick. I think we were talking about The Watchmen. The Watchmen was just being adapted into being a movie at the time, mm. and we had spent an hour just going on all the details of the history of the struggles that movie had gone through when Darren Aronofsky was trying to get it made. And he had like an early screen test that he had done with, I could be totally wrong on this because it's been forever, but I remember, um, what's his name from Game of Thrones and- uh, Game of Thrones, Aya. (laughs) <laughs> uh, the guy that was uh, guarding Daenerys for like four seasons. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, uh, Jora. Jora, yeah. He was, I believe, I could be totally wrong on this, but at the time, I remember he was originally doing screen tests to play Rorschach oh. for a Darren Aronofsky version of Watchmen. And anyway, so N- Nick and I had spent hours just talking about this stuff and we were like, God damn, we need microphones in front of us. We would love to do a podcast. Did you call it podcast back then? I don't think so. We wouldn't right? have even called it podcast. Well, actually, a... yeah, no, podcast was the thing back was then. It? It was, yeah, it was buddy. You guys were calling it like a radio show, right? Or Be, So I would say within 24 hours of me having that conversation with Nick, I was hanging out with my brother, who was previously the president of the student council at Western. And he had done numerous spots with CSRW and the radio station there at, at Western. It had come up in conversation that like, oh, Nick and I had been kind of shooting the shit over this stuff. And we were just like, oh my God, we we just think it'd be amazing if we had like a podcast or a radio show. And he, he just, he said, one second, and he pulled out his phone and pulled up a phone number. And it was for the producer at Radio Western. He said a quick hello to him and then handed the phone to me. And he's like, tell him what you just told me. And so I just said, hey, I would I was just telling my brother I'd love to do a show on a structure. We review a movie every week and then we just talk about the general status of nerd culture at the time. And this was circa 2010. So this was right after, like, I think the first Thor and Captain America were just about to come out and they had just announced that they were making the Hobbit movies. And, you know, the Dark Knight had just come out two years before it's that. Like so just like nerd, nerd culture time. was yeah. just nerd cult. culture. It was, it was <laughs> cultivating at the time. And uh, the producer at the time, I'm trying to remember their name because they changed over like a couple of months after I was there <laughs> but he was just like can you come in on Monday and we'll uh, record a demo and I was like oh god it's real it's real so I called up Nick and I called up Matt and I was like hey guys there's actually you know you know, you know that thing we were like just laughing about doing do you want to actually go do it and that was just a launching point for like an avenue for our passions to actually do something and that that evolved into the next three years of my life that completely changed and determined where I am and what I do now. Isn't that amazing how you can like look back to this moment in those conversations and that point and those decisions Uh and be like, wow, this 
was like a, almost a direct line. <laughs> I could I could probably find the timestamp in a Facebook chat with, with with Nick of when this moment happened. But yeah, from that point, that turned into a platform at Western where on a weekly basis we were going out and seeing movies, and so that for me that helped me like on a studious level, consciously watching movies, not for film class. And I'm watching, you know, East German cinema, trying to critique something that was made in the forties, but I'm actually like going out and watching the big stuff that's coming out to, mm -hmm. you know, Silver City or any Cineplex or something like that in London. And you basically did an unofficial film studies, like critical studies class, you know, 100%. And it, but it was on stuff but with films you liked. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then outside of that, we were trying to find like other things to talk about. So we were just talking comic books, video games. I'm not as much of a big gamer, but Matt and Nick were. And through doing this, it, it did well at the radio station. They really liked us. They kept us going for a while. But through that, it made other people at Western take notice of it. We had local comic shops. We had Heroes Comics at Western or, or in London reaching out to us for publicity. And that was kind of how you and I, Josh, started hanging out again. So this was called Nerd Alert, right? Can you can yeah. you describe what was Nerd Alert? Just how would you have described that at the time? I can do it by trying to just remember how the opening of the show went. Yeah. <laughs> give do us an opening yeah. of Nerd oh, Alert. Let's see if I can dig it out, shake the dust off of it. Hello, you're listening to Nerd Alert on 94.9 CHRC. I already flubbed Oh, you got a good radio voice. Yeah. We're your weekly radio show covering everything nerdy from movies to comic books and technology. I'm your host, Brad Bangsbo, blah, 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 blah. But that, that was essentially it. It was a structured yeah, show so where- fun. You have a great radio voice. Yeah. You want to come do this instead? Yeah, I was just thinking that. Like, <laughs> you could have done the intro. That's what we should do. When you guys asked me to do this, I was super excited just to pull out. Sorry, I'm going to oh, shake yeah. my microphone just to take all my old stuff out again because I haven't done this since I- shifted from nerd alert into actually doing films i just i just missed having this avenue of radio podcast culture to was it triggering one of your passions again 100 percent. you were talking about this and i was talking about with nick and matt again we were talking about trying to just do a nerd alert reunion show and just three weeks ago just because we miss it mm -hmm. granted it's different for me now that i actually work in the industry that i have to be very careful about some of the things i talk about i can't wait to get to that part <laughs> yeah i've signed ndas so i have to be careful <laughs> oh we'll see if we can get you fired please don't <laughs> no 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 Josh. <laughs> joking <laughs> joking it's okay i'll probably do it myself oh so we intersected because like i was actually traveling kind of a parallel path in some ways oh yeah and i've talked about this a bit on our show before so i won't go too much into you know my personal journey there but for me in undergrad i guess it was a little different in that i don't know for better or worse i never had that sort of What's that thing you were kind of explaining when you kind of feel like, oh, I'll never be able to do this, like other where I come from and all that stuff. Self -defeating. Like self-defeating. Yeah, self-defeating. For better or worse, I didn't have that awareness to like not pursue what I wanted to pursue. It's this weird sense of you're kicking yourself before you even try to be like, well, that's not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. So I never had that. It's like how many people really realistically get those jobs? What are the chances yeah. that I'm going to get them, right? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know for you, Josh. Like for me, I had never been around a film camera in my life at that point. But I hadn't up to a certain point either, right? Because I, my whole thing was I was thinking about going into acting, right? Right. And I did a lot of writing too. I didn't, it took me a while to realize that writing was a passion. I did so much of it. I loved it. But for some reason, I never saw it as, it took me a second to go, oh my God, this is so part of it. Yeah. <laughs> like this is so part of it. Sometimes the most exciting part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all, to me, it's all storytelling. I love storytelling. But it took me a while to realize that, you know, especially as I had my academic pursuit of psychology and neuroscience. So crazy. But then you, your passion, <laughs> sometimes I think there's you finding your passion and then there's your passion finding you, uh, right? And it feels like an undergrad, my passion kind of found me and maybe the same thing sort of happened with you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I was academically pursuing one thing, but then, you know, you see a little thing to sign up for acting in a small play. Yeah, audition for that, you realize, oh, now they've got, you could sign up to be a director or a writer of one of these plays. Oh, let's try doing that. Mm -hmm. And I did Purple Shorts. Do you remember Purple Shorts? Yes, I do. I do remember that. Yeah, no, I remember you mainly. I remember you talking about it a lot. I don't think I had a chance <laughs> to see it. But... <laughs> you were self-promoting even then, Josh. <laughs> I had to promote it at the time. We had people paid to come like watch it. It was called Purple Shorts because they were short plays and purple was Western colors, purple and white. Yeah. And... I started out by acting in one of those, but then I ended up directing three 
throughout my time at Western. That's incredible. And I ended up co-directing Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest with Patrick Barfoot. Patrick Barfoot. <laughs> Patrick yeah. Barfoot. He's definitely a, a link here for us. Definitely. So Patrick, he's the one who kind of got me into the movie side of things because he asked me to come work on something called We Eat Films that he was starting, which was a movie review show. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to just act in it. He wanted me to be one of the reviewers, which I did. I think the first thing I reviewed for that was Zombieland. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so our timelines were very much insane. Yeah, they were lining up. So I was doing that. That show quickly turned into something else. I don't know about quickly, but... By the second season, it wasn't just a movie review show. It was a show about a group of people making a movie review show. Yep. Kind of community-esque style. It was so meta. Meta was like meta. such a key word at that time and anything yeah. creative. And, and community was a major part of that. Yeah. Like, that style of storytelling was becoming really big. And it was, yeah. it was very attractive. And that was certainly what you guys were pursuing. And I, I very much respected and appreciated it. Well, it was fun because we ended up just making a TV show with, you know, we'd have to write an episode. And we had a writer's room. That's so crazy. Without even realizing it, we were doing what professionals do in many ways. And it taught me so, so much. And I ended up writing and directing and producing. And because I stuck around, I became one of the four kind of producers of that show. It was me, Patrick, Rebecca French, mm -hmm. and Sean Lott. Sean Lott. Sean Lott. Lott. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, while we were doing that, you were doing Nerd Alert. Mm -hmm. But it became pretty clear to us at some point that we're doing some similar shit. <laughs> and I'm trying to remember how you and I first, because you and I first, at some point we bumped into each other at the atrium. We were talking about what we were doing and we had that kind of like no shit moment when we yeah. talked about what we were doing. We are like, yeah. I'm kind of doing something like We're that doing too. some similar stuff. And I eventually came on Nerd Alert. I remember yeah. that. We started cross-pollinating because I know We Films was looking for promotion because we were working on the Western radio station. We just had the means of, we started running for ads for you guys on the regular. And, and then you literally made, I remember we filmed an ad for We Eat Films, the website. Yep. With And you acted in it. And the whole joke of it, if I recall, was <laughs> it was We Eat Films, which I always thought was a funny funky title because it sounded like yep. weed weed films if you didn't say mm -hmm. it right but we eat films so it was about a bunch of zombies eating films that was <laughs> one of the very first things i ever directed <laughs> oh and you directed it that's yeah, right i directed i think it was for, for it was both patrick and i but that was one of the first things i remember I, I did up the storyboards for it it was actually nick nick you can find it online if you yeah, everybody I remember wants nick to know what the hell zombie. nick looks like nick's <laughs> he was, a zombie in there no he wasn't a zombie he was the was guy it? running oh he was he guy was, running from this he didn't he become running. a zombie at the end so it ended with he's being chased <laughs> by zombies they're running him up the stairs he gets to a door and then tries to escape it the door's locked but he sees there's a zombie on the other side and the zombie just pushes on the door handle and it opens. And so all of a sudden he's just surrounded. And as they start eating him and like, th th and this was all Oh, great. is they're eating him? His this was in season one of Walking Dead. Came Instead out. of intestines coming out, it was like it was tape rolls. Reels of tape. It was just, <laughs> no, it was reels of tape. That was the whole idea. It's we eat film. So they were just pulling out spools of VHS tapes and stuff like that. And then at one point they pulled out a copy of Bambi and then somebody started eating Bambi. I remember, no, not Bambi. No, no, not Bambi. He's been through enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, remember that now so clearly. Uh, I didn't realize you directed it. I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, you directed it. That was between both Patrick and I, because we were both kind of like walking through it, but I drew up a whole bunch of storyboards and I took out of like a digital camera and I picked all the shots and I put it in the frames and we handed that over and we just did shot for shot, essentially that. Wow, okay, so you did this commercial for We Eat Films and then you also, I think you probably acted on here and there in an episode in a small role. I don't know if I ever actually made it into didn't an you, episode. Not no. even the finale one where you came in, weren't you just there? at one point? I don't think so. I can't remember. Like the things that we did, you and I did the, the We Eat Film special, oh. We Drink Films. I watched that. I just watched that. Yeah. Yeah, it was the first and final episode of We Drink Films. Please, Which is Brad, unfortunate because this. it was incredible. It was. <laughs> it turned I, out I, so I've well. I've been told it's one of the funniest things we've ever done. I found it entertaining and I don't like drunk people, but I found that pretty entertaining. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is, yeah. I, I mean, Josh, you're like very much classic drunk person like you've got the speech slurring you're like kind of falling asleep on brad at one point you're like, oh this guy oh this guy like it was, it was pretty entertaining some point i lose my pants you yeah, do yeah. you do lose your pants <laughs> so what this was was we because this show that we did we eat films like i said it was a show about a group of people making a film review show but it would have actual film reviews in each episode but then we started making reviews just outside of the episode just general film reviews and you could just watch reviews and not the episodes. And then we thought, hey, let's do We Drink Films where we review a film, but we do it drunk. 
or we do it while getting drunk and then we're drunk. I don't know. It was very experimental for us, but we ended up playing shot checkers. You were playing checkers. Yeah. So the idea was, cause I remember this was one of the few times I'd only gotten into it. There was a point after when our nerd alert and we film world was colliding and I think there was maybe like four times I sat in on like a Wii Films writing meeting <laughs> or it wasn't even like writing, but it was just like, what do we do next? What are some projects and stuff we want to do? And yeah, that was when We Drink Films came up. And I know there was a number of people in the room that were trepidatious, like, oh, I don't know if I want to be drunk on camera and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. I was just like, Pfft. I was like, I'll do I'll it. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. And now it's there forever. <laughs> and, and I still share that thing. No shame. As much. It, it's yeah. great. I thought it turned out it, so funny. It's pretty entertaining. Yeah. I remember the editing being kind of tough. And that was why we probably didn't do other ones. Just it took a long time to edit. I'm certain it was needed. Yeah, because we, we basically edited a whole game of us playing shot checkers. And basically, whenever one of our pieces were taken, we had to drink the piece because the piece was made out of shot glasses. Mm. And there was a point <laughs> where you were kicking my ass. And then I lost at the end. Yeah, that was that was <laughs> exciting because it looked like Josh was definitely going to win. And then it cut. But the alcohol started to kick like, in. And, and then, then I started made, making and I made, bad movie and, <laughs> <laughs> and then you made a terrible move. And Brad's like, that's the worst move you possibly could <laughs> and have like, made. And, and then I ended yeah, up getting even sense. more drunk because I had to drink the rest of them. <laughs> the so thing was, the entire time we were playing that, I still had like a martini on the side. Yeah, you were just kind of like, you were really chill going. the whole time. <laughs> I went from at the beginning being pretty like with it to the end not being with it. I don't know. We were all over each other. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was weird. No, it was it was really funny. But uh, so like the idea of the Shaw Checkers, I remember that came about was we were we reviewed the Shawshank Redemption. We yes. probably should point that out. <laughs> we, so the premise when we were sitting out of the meeting being talking about the idea of this we drink film stuff was could we think of films that we could tie in drinking games to and make those unique and how they related to the movie. I remember there was talk of us trying to do the thing and we were going to try and think of a way of drinking that would be similar to like the test that they would have to do. Wow, that's or, oh. uh, Yeah, it was something dumb, but we were always trying to, we, we had a few things that we were trying to think of games that could be part of the entertainment of, so the first part would be watching us get wasted, knowing that we had to do a review by the end of it. And that was also the motivation of why we were trying to find films that we knew we had at least seen a thousand times. Yeah. So we could still yeah. somehow find a way to make that's our way That's right, because you're getting drunk <laughs> while watching a new movie. It's kind of, I mean, I guess that's fun, but then you also want to watch the movie and enjoy it. And you wouldn't have anything to fall back on. You'd be like, oh, I, I can't even remember the main character's name. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could have been funny in and of itself, mm -hmm. I guess. Certainly. But then you would maybe ruin the experience of watching a movie you would have been like to watch. So should have done the hangover. <laughs> now we could just review movies we made yeah. ourselves. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> or review uh yeah. what's what's your not only that by the way we'll probably get to this we both made wing movies we did i made a movie called death by hot wings and you made one called wingman wingman it was a period film shot in 2012 that was Mitchell set during Burrell. 2009 yeah mitch Brell, <laughs> yeah Yo, so we'll get to that in a sec but yeah, We Drink Films was great. And I definitely recommend we do something like this again because it was, we've always talked about it. We're like, we should totally- It has come up many times, yeah. yeah. And that actually brings us to our next point. This is actually going to be the first and last episode of We Drink <laughs> Adulthood Friends. Uh, <laughs> Aren't you drinking right now? Yeah, Brad's <laughs> Brad? doing it for the three you of us. Look at that. <laughs> you need a refill there? I just like, hey, this is a celebration. I haven't done a podcast in a while. Oh. I'm going to pour a glass of scotch, get cozy. Yeah, I noticed you have proper, yeah. You've got like proper equipment, yeah, you know. I, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. I didn't not mean a... the glass. I meant. I meant your microphone. You've got oh, like yeah. podcast equipment. So this is from the Nerd Alert days. Everything but proper internet. Everything but proper internet. <laughs> Sorry about your editing, Josh. Yes. No, no, it's okay right now. Oh, we're jinxing it though. So we crossed paths. You obviously got involved with We Eat Films. I came on to talk about. What did I come into Nerd Alert to talk about? Certainly, we were talking about weed films. Like the the initial part of it was promotion for that, and then some movie review, probably. Uh, it, one hundred percent. We would have closed out with like picking a movie that would have been out at the time that we reviewed. But right. for the life of me, I cannot remember. And I remember being there was with you, Matt Belford, and Nick Workman. Yep. Right. And it was all of us sitting around, and I remember thinking, "This is so cool, Brad. You have a legit radio show." It was in like a yeah. it, exactly what you imagine like an office for a radio show would look like, and all the equipment, Full soundboard, the mixing and board. And I was was like I just got to be a part of this dream I thought that was so cool it was the only time I think I've done that that was awesome it was a unique experience yeah but the thing and uh, thank you in saying that I, I can only say that I felt the same way when I was kind of getting when you were inviting me into 
your circle of wheat films because you mean when we made things in like a classroom <laughs> yes well, well so that was it like uh, like i said there was the the question of what my passion was was i wanted to make films or i just i wanted to do something with films and mm -hmm. i was still had that foot in that realm of like being a filmmaker is not realistic i don't think it's realistic i don't know i've never touched the camera i've never done any of that so it seems too daunting don't do it but hey i'm in this realm where it's something i'm passionate about i can talk about it all the time and then when we started hanging out again and i started seeing what you were doing with weed films i was like what what, what are you shooting this with and you're like oh this is my canon 7d and he showed it to me and i was just like you don't you don't use film like this, oh, this is, that's so that's such good quality oh my god you just <laughs> how much did that cost okay and immediately I go and I buy my own DSLR and, and it's like, you can use interchangeable lenses. So wait a minute, I, I, I would just load this on my computer. I don't need to know a damn thing about processing film. And I can load a program where I can just edit this all by myself. Did I ever tell, I told you where I learned about, you know, I ended up producing the TV show. One of the deals was I let them use my camera equipment, mm -hmm. but I ended up getting that camera equipment and learning about it from, do you know who? Did I ever tell you this? No. Grant Vesna. Grant Vesna. Oh my God. I haven't thought about him in so long. Yeah. Grant <laughs> Vesna, who we also knew from high school, and he's an orthodontist now, hmm. <laughs> a professor of orthodontics at the moment. Hey, good for and, him. Yeah. No, he's doing great. <laughs> but he, my early films, like he was the cinematographer and he taught me about. Oh, he, I do he was, remember that. Sorry. Yeah. Didn't, he continue. was an avid like photography person and he loved learning about cameras and he taught me about cameras of all people. Actually, he acted in one season one episode of We Eat Films. He was the first episode <laughs> I ever directed. I, I directed Grant. I'm sure if he comes on the show, we'll talk about that. Oh, now you have to. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he taught me. I remember I was looking for a camera. I wanted to start shooting my own movies. I wanted to shoot because my first movie was Death by Hot Wings. Mm -hmm. But a guy who eats suicide wings and dies. It's a great movie. Find it. YouTube. And his friends are all like, he's dead. And they're like well, what did he have? And they're like, suicide wings. And they're like, well, what did he expect? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very Josh. Yeah. It was all like one joke <laughs> just drawn Josh. out. It was a ridiculous first <laughs> I liked it as a first movie. It was definitely a good first movie. I didn't want to be overly serious. Sounds very clever. It's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unlike me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I liked God. your first movie. And well, I want to get into that. Well, you were a substantial part of that. That's not the part I liked, but... <laughs> Okay, so when I was looking for a camera to get, I remember looking up like these were like prosumer cameras I was looking into and there was very little information about digital cameras because the truth was it was still pretty new, mm -hmm. you know, using digital cameras, especially digital cameras for consumers like yeah. us, like people who were You're putting it not on super filthy rich. 10 gig SD cards and you're yeah. maxing out at 1080p. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't have a lot to go on and learn and I made some mistakes along the way and not realizing what else was out there. And the first camera I got was a Sony NX cam. Mm. I remember Grant going through a list of these different cameras I could get. He's like, this one's a hundred dollars. This is a few hundred dollars. This one's like a thousand. And I was like, what about that one? And he's like, that's $6,000, Josh. <laughs> and I was like, I'm getting that one. He's like, you're insane. And I'm like, yeah, but if I get this camera, then I'm going to make movies because <laughs> I'm yeah, investing okay. in that. So I got the $6,000 camera and we shot Death by Hot Wings with it. And it turned out fine. But I was like, you know what? By that point, I learned about DSLRs. So I was like, Grant, I need to get another camera. <laughs> and he was like, you're insane, Josh. And I got a two or $3,000 Canon 7D, you know, lenses and whatever. It's a gorgeous camera and it's still good. That thing still works. People, <laughs> oh, that thing still... still looks great. And I ended up shooting my next movie, Elevator, with both those cameras. But in, ultimately, I ended up shooting movies with the DSLR. And we used the NX cam for run and gun kind of, we eat films type mm -hmm. episode stuff, right? It wasn't as good in low light. Anyway, I digress. That was my learning experience, you know, with my dentist cinematographer. That's such a great story. <laughs> yeah, that's, and so like, you're all going, wow, you did. I mean, I was trial by fire with that stuff. And so was my group of uh, We Eat Films comrades. That's what was amazing about it. It was just like, hey, shit, you're actually doing it. And again, like I, I was coming from a perspective of like, we live in London, Ontario, like well, we're not going to, how, how the hell are we going to get out of here if that's what we're trying to do? So seeing you actually doing it was just like, oh my God. Okay. Show me, show me. <laughs> I'm amazed any of that stuff, like the stuff turned out like it did. Actually, I'm very proud of those times. I like to say, you know, warts and all. I love it because for what we knew and what we had at the time, it, I'd say, I'd say it was a success. In fact, we had a series finale of our show. That's incredible. 
But the thing I wanted to ask you about was, so this is quite the story, but you ended up making a Nerd Alert movie. Was this the first thing you shot or no? Nerd Alert movie was the second thing. Okay, so was Genevieve the first? Yes, Genevieve was the first movie. Okay, Aya, did you get a chance to see Genevieve before or no? No. She was like, I watched that We Drink Films thing and fuck it, I'm not watching anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched something. <laughs> also because- I, I've seen enough. You never know, like I never know what my opinion might be and I'm always worried about like, I'm sure it's great, but I don't generally like <laughs> short films. So if it's not, I would have said something it's really not. mean and I probably would have told you whatever the truth would have been, good or bad. That's fair, so, completely fair. So I didn't want to watch it. No. And also I didn't have that much time because Josh told me four o'clock. Hey, we're doing this in a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but i'm sure it's great i i liked the void moore's void i appreciate that thank you so i'm sure this one was good too i mean watching genevieve and then watching moore's void and seeing first of all i think genevieve you did a great job at her first movie thank you it was better than most first movies and i think it holds up in many ways you can read the comments online it was super educational it's on youtube <laughs> yeah well the comments online are like almost all positive well that's nice and pe online people hate everything yeah exactly but people like that movie. which is why i was surprised the comments were good <laughs> I, oh it's probably good you're just very like you're very modest that's that's good it's look it's, it's easy to look back and see the little you know first time movie flaws or whatever but mm -hmm. you pull something off there and I, you can describe it in a second but i worked with you on that right because i was the cinematographer mm -hmm. and i used my camera if i recall mm -hmm. and then you were the main editor on it with me oh yeah I edited with you and then i also acted in it yes you were an actor in it as well this is one of the craziest roles i ever gosh is an abusive <laughs> boyfriend and so is your ex-girlfriend yes. oh. yeah. i was abusing your ex-girlfriend yeah, it was weird. It wasn't next at the time that we were filming. <laughs> no, yeah. She's just like, she want to be an actress and just, all right, hey, let's try this. And then after that. Whitney, we'll, right? Yes. She's actually in the finale of Weed Films, I think. Yes, she is. Yeah. Yeah. So onto the topic of what we've been going over, following your passions. I, I, it's interesting that Genevieve was literally a film about being a bystander and not doing something you feel you should be doing. <laughs> And that's what the plot of it was basically, right? About a guy who, a guy who sees something going down, a guy, so I was the bad guy and I'm abusing Whitney's character and Matt Belford. You, it was a domestic disturbance or it was a domestic abuse situation unfolding in public. Yeah. And, and Matt Belford was the lead and he walks by and sees that and everybody's seeing it and nobody's doing anything. And that's known as the Kitty Genovese syndrome or Genovese syndrome or the bystander. Yeah, it's effect. bystander syndrome. And Genovese is a reference because that's where kind of, it was one of the more public examples of where this has happened, where there was a woman, oh, it's been years since I've, Kitty, her name was Kitty Genovese. I forget what city this was happening in, but it was essentially a case of in public at night in the middle of a complex of an apartment building. She was, um, essentially murdered, but while calling out for help, there were numerous people all watching from the apartment building and everybody assumed someone else was going to do something about it or didn't want to get involved. And Jeez. it just unfolded and nobody did anything. Yeah, it's a real thing. It's a psychological phenomenon mm -hmm. and it's sad and it's tragic. And you captured, well, you captured that, but yours was the story about the guy who chose to do something and why. Well, it was supposed to be two parallel worlds because I was approaching from it. And I think this was what learning about filmmaking at the time because I think the original version I shot it was completely from Matt the main character the perspective of the bystander so I could try and analyze and understand like why wouldn't somebody be doing something and again this was one of the first scripts I had written since like drama class and mm -hmm. I remember the early cuts of us going through it it was just that horrible example of show don't tell and there was just so much telling in the narration there was narration right there was there narration was a... in the original cut ah we went back a year later right and we shot it was almost a year we sat on it for a, quite a while we were just like something's not right and we were trying to think of how we could fix it and at that point in time like i'd been kind of going through that evolution myself of what do i want to do with my life and i felt like i was caught in a moment of not doing something I felt like I wanted to do. And so I started trying to put the parallel of being a bystander with your own life, paralleling the situation. Oh, that's cool. And so we filmed this new scene where it was from the main character's perspective back home where he was essentially in his own domestic abuse situation where he was getting kind of- Emotionally abused. Verbally, emotionally. It was an emotional abuse. Yeah. Of just being chastised for inaction and not 
doing or living up to the things that he felt he should or was capable of doing. By his partner, yeah. Yeah. Who was that? Who played her? She that's um Megan. Megan MacArthur. She's uh Megan MacArthur. She's so lovely. And she acted in one of my other films as well. Yes. No, she's a great person, she's a great, great actress. I haven't talked with her in years. But she did an incredible job. And 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 so yeah, this was just a learning experience for our first film of we went back, we shot this whole other narrative, and then all of a sudden we had these two different stories that were being shown and unfolded, and you weren't just telling the audience how they should feel. Yeah. And all of a sudden they had this nice parallel where you know, we intercut those two, like we him with the, his kind of you know, that emotionally abusive situation with his girlfriend. And then him, is he going to do mm-hmm. something in the present time, right? With a situation he watched unfolding. That was 100% it. Yeah. And that was kind of his backstory a little bit of why he went and did something because he was chastised for never taking action. So now he's going to take action. Exactly. That was the premise. That was the plot. Like, are you going to do something or not? Yeah. Yeah. So that was the first working with you, Josh. That was the first film I had ever shot. It was, you know, when you go through that, like I obviously had things that I really, really loved about it. And things were like, oh, I wish I could do this differently. And, you know, things where you like. Dude, he got into like a few festivals. Oh, it did, yeah. No, it did. Good, like, did UWO Festival, but, it's, you know, like. Ivy. Yeah, it did Ivy. I remember that. And so from there, that you know all of a sudden I was like okay cool what next can I do and I find it odd that like I did such a heavy drama film first and then the film that I have going through the festivals right now is also like a heavy film because everything in the middle I've done is just such stupid comedy (laughs) it's just it's (laughs) because I love comedy I love playing with that everything I've done is just such playful comedy and but it's weird that these two things that have been like the bigger projects I've done have been these I mean um, I think those exist within you those two sides you know those definitely I love dark humor I love dark twisted humor but I like things that just that still make you think and then if I can also make you laugh at the same time then I'm then yeah I'm golden I'm happy and I think you and I both have that in common with a lot of our projects. I think so. I think we have a lot in common there. Yeah, you definitely like a lot. You're big on philosophy. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. You know, this film we worked on later, we can talk about there, but your next one was Nerd Alert, the movie. <laughs> was your next project, we should say. It was fun because like Nerd Alert was doing well. We were having so much fun and what well, we were rocking and rolling with it. I was like, wouldn't it be fun if we just did a radio play? Like I, I can write a script and oh yeah, if we did a radio play, we can make fun of that whole Orson Welles story from War of the Worlds where like somebody, you know, a bunch of people committed suicide because they thought it was real. I was like, oh yeah, so what if we just did a thing? It's about us in the radio station. We decided for an episode, we did the War of the Worlds, but we're just reading like the plot and we're referring to Tim Robbins and Tom Cruise the entire time. And then <laughs> then all of a sudden we're on the run because somebody calls in and says that their husband thought it was real. And mm-hmm. But we did it. We shot the whole thing. And you made it as a movie, not as a radio play. We made it as a movie. Like, well, we ended up it, like it kept growing and growing as we were writing that like, hey, this is actually kind of funny. Why don't we just try fucking shooting it? And everybody was in that, like almost like everybody. We had a whole we had substantial portion of the wheat film staff, yourself included. Sean and I played cops, like bumbling cops. Incredible cops. The wigs that you guys had. <laughs> we had these crazy <laughs> wigs that we were wearing. Borderline Austin Powers. Gareth Bush was in it as well. He was a homeless guy that turned into a zombie. <laughs> There's something involving Batman, Matt Belford. Oh, yeah. That was a running gag where somehow in the midst of us out running the law, we just somehow destroy everything. It was just all about us ruining everything. And I think Matt inadvertently accidentally starts the zombie apocalypse in the background. And that's the <laughs> only way he manages to salvage us or get us out of prison is that he created this horrible event that distracted everyone else. <laughs> I often think of like if we're looking at kind of parallelism here. What this film to you was what, it, for me, I think at the time, The Suit was. Yes. And you also acted in my film, The Suit. The Suit took me like a whole summer to shoot. I wanted to do so, so much. It wasn't perfect, but I just got so many people involved. It was involved. a great movie. Oh, it was such a good movie, man. I still love it. <laughs> I do have a you know a soft spot for that film, you know, warts and all. And you were in it and you were a part of it and you helped me edit it and get that done. And I'll always forever be thankful. Yeah. But I felt like what that movie was for me was what Nerd Alert the movie was for you. And that took you how long to shoot? Uh, It took probably... Like a whole summer as well, right? It took a whole summer as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, which is different than other... Fil- like I shoot movies now in two days, three days, yeah, oh my four God. days, five days, short films, right? This is a summer of shooting. You're not paying anybody. So it's just like, are you available? 
Yeah. <laughs> Do I have incentive to be available? No. This is a huge passion project. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And how would you define a passion project? Uh, just something that says something that you love, you know, you're excited about that you have no choice but to do it. And it doesn't usually involve people getting paid. <laughs> usually doesn't involve people getting paid or you're willing to eat the, you're willing to take on the costs yeah. that come with it. Yeah. So this story, as we're telling it, Aya, sounds like a wonderful, beautiful story, but this is actually a tragedy. Uh, yeah. Oh, God. So I was shooting Nerd Alert the summer right before I had, you know, finally come to the conclusion that, you know what, filmmaking is what I want to do. The bud, like, it became real. Once I got that taste of it from working with Josh, there was just like, hey, this is, it's tangible now. It wasn't something that was just so far out of reach that, you know, like, hey, I can get out of London maybe yeah. with this. And we had shot another movie in there too before this happened, right? Yes. You and I had shot something called The Socratic Irony. The Socratic Irony, yeah. And it starred you and you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was about a guy trying to figure out if he was insane or not by having a Socratic dialogue with an imaginary version of himself. <laughs> yeah, and we had these like camera tricks and we used Andrew Keenapple as your body double. You know Andrew Keenapple, right, Aya? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so Brad, you and Andrew were like best friends since high school. We have too. a similar build and he, yeah, he's a really good friend of mine. Oh, I, yeah, you guys don't actually look alike, but I could see no. how like from the general. Their build worked, like if you're using it, you know, shooting from behind. Like the tall. Exactly. He yeah. cut his hair for that, didn't he? Yeah, we both went to go get a haircut at the same place and just got identical haircuts. So that yeah. I could use them in all the over the shoulder shots. Yeah. And... and it had cameos from me and Gareth and Roman. Yeah. If I recall. Yeah. And Nathan Jackson. Oh, yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a fun little shoe you know I'll, we used a classroom it was very that was very you like the writing of it was very philosophical it's not something i remember thinking this is something it's very brad yeah it, but i co-directed it with you if i recall which was the story because i knew i was going to be on camera and i've yes. like almost never done that since then because it was just like yeah. oh god i can't do that <laughs> but you had the footage you were going to edit it and you were going to edit nerd alert the movie yeah yeah and then I had, and, and it was at this point that I started having these things come together and it was just such a hectic time because I was like, okay, I'm going to go to film school. Uh, so I applied and got into uh, Fanshawe College for their host film programs, which was just a one year, just a one year after the fact. And it was an incredible program. That was where my confidence was like really started to take off once I started seeing the tools that they all had available. And I was just like frothing at the mouth of like, show me what else you got. You got a dolly, you got a jib. What else you got? You know, you got all these big ass lights. How does that work? Knowledge, knowledge. And with that happening and getting projects on a daily, daily basis, I didn't touch Nerd Alert or Socratic Irony for some time because I was just nonstop with everything. The thing that was great about this program was it was very similar to what I find the actual industry is like. You were doing 12 to 14 hour days on a regular basis, constantly working on editing or doing something. Yeah, because you went off to Fanshawe for that and I went off to USC. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had some interesting parallel kind of tracks. Yeah, definitely. And coming out of that program, like I was super fortunate. I did well in the class. I had a documentary I was really proud of. I had a short, which is our the other chicken wing story. Wingman. We Wingman. Starring Mitchell Brell. Uh, yeah, yeah, Mitch Brell. And he was fucking fantastic. And that is- What was that rates. about? Tell us. <laughs> Tell Aya what Wingman was about. Wingman was about a, and how it a, didn't rip off Death by Hot Wings. No, no, it I'm didn't. just no. It was it was about a group of house like the Conan O'Brien situation. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> it's about a group of housemates dealing with one of their roommates going through a heart of darkness like downward spiral in their basement after he discovered there was a chicken wing shortage before the 2009 Super Bowl. <laughs> that's, that's, like literally, it. that's literally the plot of the that's movie. That's great. That sounds great. I enjoy that. How high were you when you came up with that? No, I wasn't. I wasn't at all. It was literally at Fancho. We were sitting eating wings at lunch. And we, yeah, that, we, that's the real question. That's what How happened to me. Chicken wings did yeah. you eat to think of this? Yeah. I was eating hot wings or suicide wings at <laughs> Alibi Roadhouse when there I came go. up oh, with Alibi. Death by Hot Wings. So I'm we telling found you, man. The real inspiration for both of these Wings movies were Wings. We're Wings. We're Wings. Who would have guessed? <laughs> but it was all the premise because we were all poor and cheap. So there was a bunch of us eating Wings mm -hmm. and we only got like one pound and we only got like two of them. Oh, no. I made a joke about taking the bones, planting them and growing a tree out of it. And so the plot of I guess in my description of Wingman that was also critical was hid the insanity of the roommate in the basement was that he was planning on growing a chicken wing tree oh, to save the cool. Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be good to save the chickens too, right? Yes, exactly. It was just a really, it was a good movie. I remember that. And it cast, similarly, you cast Mitchell Brell in this movie of yours. And I had mm -hmm. cast him around, I think around a similar time in Psychopath for a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was all that same era. Wow. And then, okay, so you did Wingman. Wingman was great. 
but you came back to, and similarly, by the way, I was coming back to the suit because it was just, I remember I had this, when I shot that film over a summer and everything, it was technically the third movie I'd ever shot or that I ever directed. I had done Genovese in there before that and stuff with you, but I had never, Mm -hmm. it was the third movie I directed. Right. And that movie was chaos. Like it was disorganized, all this stuff. Like you were helping me edit and put stuff together. It but was it took big. me, it was a it was big. big. It was like a 26 minute movie in the end. And yeah. it took me years. It took me years to finish it. People, there was like a joke, like Josh, when is the suit coming out? And I didn't want to be that person who didn't <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> not finish. <laughs> it didn't, you know, I very much believe in finishing what you start. And that one was so difficult to finish. You had so many issues and problems and things I had to fix and post. Right. You probably had a bit of a mess of footage as well for Nerd Alert to sift through. Yeah, because you make so many mistakes and you're like, well, I clearly didn't know what access meant at that point <laughs> when I shot this because I'm totally, why does it feel so confusing? <laughs> yeah, so it takes a while to find the time and energy to really go through that and edit it, so... But you were going to come back to it. Oh, I 100% was. I, I had a lot of confidence with, with the footage that we got. It was like, yeah. it was so dumb. You made a trailer. We made a trailer. And it still uh, exists. That still exists. But with the rough cut that I had of the film so far, I was maybe like three quarters of the way through it. Oh, man. I was really happy with it. It was, it was just so dumb in the greatest way possible. And like its flaws were kind of its success at the same time. And that's how I was feeling about it. Yeah. And as I was going through film school and I was learning all these new techniques, I was just kind of like, you know what? put nerd alert on hold. I can just re go through this whole thing with everything I've learned. And that was my plan. So Fanshawe finished wingman did well, got that film uh, coming out of the program. Woo, I was woo-hoo. feeling like hot shit, like hot wings. Yeah. Right. And moving to Toronto, we were supposed to do an internship and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, screw that. I'll see if I can get an actual job. So I started doing background work in the industry and got on a bunch of shows. And then I applied to be part of the Director's Guild of Canada. So I was like a set PA. And so I started getting on the shows so I could, that way I could actually, um, you know, see the machine. I wanted to see like... I would work with a proper call sheet. I would have to interact with every single department and just kind of get a better idea. And for me, my thought was like, hey, I can do this, pay my bills. And it's in the industry. Yeah, it's in the industry. And I can start networking with lots of people to then use for my next project. Anyway, so back to the nerd alert disaster. As I was moving to Toronto and this was all getting started and starting to work as a PA, my laptop was stolen. (laughs) <laughs> you were at a oh. bar, right? I was at a bar. I had gone out that afternoon and I was writing a script and I had my laptop with me and I'd sat there writing for hours and a bunch of people had been texting me and they asked what I was up to. So they came to join. So I had a whole bunch of people there and I had my bag with me. And by that point, we hung, we spent our whole night there. <laughs> and at one point we got up to leave. And by this point, we had probably been drinking too much. Not probably, we had been. And I got up to walk out of the bar and then I had an oh shit moment, turned around, walked back in to go get my bag. And there was another group of people sitting there and I went to talk to them. I was like, hey, oh my God, uh, good. Have you seen, where's my bag? Have you seen it? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. One, one guy had it and he, he just went out to give it to the front of the bar. I went to go talk to the bar. They're like, nope, nobody brought a bag. So I went to go like stare down that guy who said that and wait for his friend to come back. And the guy came back maybe 40 minutes later. So he clearly took my bag to his house to take it somewhere. And I literally sat with these guys as I called 911 (laughs) because they kept, because before that guy, when he entered to come and talk to the friend that told me his friend took my bag away, I went, I was like, Hey, where's my bag? And he was like, what bag? I was like, cool. I'll hang out with you guys for a little bit. And I called the cops and I was like, how's your night going? And I was just so mad at them. But at this point, unfortunately, a robbery in a city like Toronto or something stolen, it's going to take hours and hours for them to actually bother to show up for that. So then uh, the cops never showed up and I, I couldn't keep waiting with these guys forever. And, you know, at what point do I try and follow them or something stupid like that? And I'm only just moved to the city. I'm like, this is going to go bad. <laughs> it's a dumb idea. And unfortunately, that's just where it went. They just, the cops like never came and these guys eventually got up to leave and I was putting up position of like do i follow them to try and get my shit back or now and just never got it so film gone because i was an idiot and didn't have a proper backup because i hadn't Mm -hmm. learned to do that properly so that's rule always back up your Mm -hmm. shit that sucks (laughs) that means all the months and years actually you put into that just it was all on that laptop and that laptop was stolen it's just 
Yep. I, that hurts. It hurt me so much to hear that. And that wasn't the only movie you had on there. No. Josh, why are you like bringing up old like wounds? Like, oh, that's not the only thing you lost, right? Tell well, us what no, you lost. no, but no, he... no. There's a reason I'm bringing this up. Oh, OK. Yeah, I, you were too soon. Socratic irony was so, so on there. So the Socratic so... irony that we shot was also on that laptop. But, Josh, but you had a backup. After you Josh. told me what happened, I wanted I felt really bad. So I decided I was going to like quietly edit it myself. I was also too heartbroken to touch it. Like I was yeah. just like, and I was just like, I don't know. I couldn't do it. And then as you started editing it, I was like, thank God, I probably can't stare at myself because I was acting. And I was like, I don't. Is even that what happened? Because I, I remembered it a little differently. I remember thinking that I was going to, my goal was to like surprise you with a cut of it. You did. You didn't tell me it. Uh, oh, I didn't tell you. Were, you didn't tell me that you were editing it at first. You were just okay, like, yeah, you so got to do it. You got to do it. And I was just like, I can't, man. I just. Okay. So I surprised. Yeah. Right. So I at least told you I had footage of it. Yeah. At the time. Okay. So I did that. I thought I, I guess I forgot that I told you that, but then I surprised edited it. Yeah. You ended up editing it. You showed it to me. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> oh, that's nice. All yeah. Right. You know, a movie was salvaged. And oh, and I owe you for that so much. And again, that, that movie's got like 20,000 views on YouTube yeah, and people there. love it on there. That was an interesting film to edit, actually. I learned a lot because I was <laughs> editing two versions of you. That was where we started doing the split screen yeah. stuff. And it was an interesting, like that. it was a ballsy trick for when we had only made like five movies between the two of us at that point yeah we're trying to get creative split screen shifting and two actors and doubles and stuff like that yeah. it, was, it was interesting That's complex stuff. and you still always had the trailer of nerd alert to remember oh yeah i, I watched that thing uh once a year just to be like no shit I, do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the memories will always be there brad oh totally but yeah it, it was a great experience and uh yeah, you know, it's a tough one to lose because I would have loved to, if I had that footage, I would love to go back and read it knowing what I know now. I mean, it could be worse. You could have shot an entire feature like some people we know and then never released it just because. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, we, uh, I know <laughs> multiple people who have that dilemma and you know, it's, it's the reality of sometimes you make something that you put so much passion into and you can't reconcile the fact that you're not happy with it. So you just... Mm let it rot yeah or it's just so disorganized that you can't figure out how to how to finish, finish it. it yeah 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 there's so many factors behind it yeah yeah, yeah so we've uh, been talking for quite a bit and as often happens with a guest actually it happens not with a guest as well but uh you know we have a lot more to say so what do you say we put an end to this part of what we're talking about and we'll continue on in another episode you can't shut me up <laughs> Well, we're not going to. We're just going to pause. We're not. We're just pausing and then you're going to continue. Uh, yeah. So this has been another episode of Adulthood Friends. This is episode 44. Thanks for listening. And if you enjoyed this, please follow us on all the stuff. And wherever you're listening, please press the subscribe thing and you'll hear much more from us. Spotify, Facebook. Spotify, yeah. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Overcast, anywhere you like to listen. And uh, yeah, how do we usually end this thing? We're not really ending it. But we're ending it for this week. I think the music should just cut us off oh. at any point right now. Punch it. in the bathroom let's talk shit about her who the fuck is aya no, who, the, who the fuck is she who does she think she is no i honestly don't know <laughs> <laughs> remember your ex-girlfriend amanda <laughs> who's amanda no. <laughs> this has been fun man i appreciate it yeah but what about that aya chick who uh, it's A Y A. She was just keep pretending like you remember her from high school. <laughs> the thing where it's just a blank <laughs> stare. I'm like, I'm actually looking at your forehead or your nose because <laughs> I don't want you to see that I can't recognize. She's like, I'm pretending that I saw Moore's void. So because he's such assholes. No, I. <laughs> so I left my headphones on so I could still hear you, even though I was like, what? Doing Obviously, you knew, which is why you did all your. What are you talking about, Aya? That's crazy. <laughs> what? Okay. We were just joking. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, man. I appreciate being part of the conversation. That was nice. <laughs>